Artist Talk Art, a program supported by Golden Artist Colors and the Silicon Valley Open Studios. Every year, during the first three weekends in May, more than 300 Silicon Valley artists open their studios to the public. This free event lets you discover some exciting new artistic talent or get up close and personal with some of your favorite artists. You can find out more about Open Studios by going to our website, svos.org. You can find out more about Golden by going to goldenpaints.com. Today, we're going to talk to two dynamic artists, Jill Andre and Maya Babacheska. Both women are highly experienced fine artists, and they are also art teachers. They're going to discuss being art teachers and how they do it. Maya, thanks for coming. Thank you for Jill, inviting me. Thanks for coming thanks to Talk Art me. once again. Yes, thank you. Well, both of you are veteran artists here at Talk Art, and I'm so happy you come today to talk about your newest adventures, which are, which is, teaching, teaching art. Now, I think first I want to know, and so does the studio audience, want to know why you're teaching. Jill, why don't you start and talk to us about well, it? Well, I want to uh, share my experience of what I call unblanking the canvas. I myself have a fear of a white canvas. I don't yeah. know what to do with it if I go in the studio. I'm daunted by that. Aren't we all? Yes, and so, <laughs> and I think you do this too, Maya, is I've developed a technique of doing lots of small studies in preparation for a painting. I don't really know what the painting's gonna be, but I do lots of small paintings. I'll do variations on a theme Mm -hmm. um, try out different colors, and by working small, I can work really quickly. I can make little changes that, that change the whole feeling of it. I can work on the composition when it's small versus when I do a larger painting. I really have to kind of know the overall composition. If I start out too large, it takes too much paint. Um, you, I get frustrated by it. So. I know a lot of artists like to work out in the field landscape and they have their source that they look at. Well, I've developed these sketches that I look at as my source. And it's, and it's, it's fun. fun. It's, it's fun because you're doing, you're doing lots of things and you don't get attached to one in particular. Well, it and, it, fun. and it's actually, it's very playful because you can cut and paste and glue and, and I, I often, I rip things from magazines. Uh -huh. Do you, well, you want to well, show that? Well, well, oh, yeah. Yeah, here we go. So this is how you rip things from magazines, okay? Uh, and and then this is you you actually design your canvas based I do. on what you've collaged on just paper. So this is pretty inexpensive stuff. It is, and it's do. fast yeah. and effective, and you can work on the composition, the lights and the darks, and but it's fun. They also are interesting in and of themselves. The little the little collages. So if you want to just make little small paintings or small collages, they're just fun. They're playful. They're very playful, and I think Maya, you were talking about. I'm going to put this down now. Uh, you were talking about how playful you are. Well, actually, your paintings are very playful. I mean, this is a landscape. If you didn't have the two buildings and the tree in there, it would be totally abstract. It just says your paintings are abstracted. So, are you also going to teach? Do you think can you teach playfulness to your art to your students? I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. I think you just need a big brush, for example. So, if you're afraid of a white canvas. Take a big brush, like this one, like paint, and just paint the whole canvas, for example, dark, and it's not white anymore. And I do similar thing as Jill. I do sketches mm -hmm. because uh, paint dries for a long time. So, for example, oil, I'm going to teach oil. If I started something and the composition is wrong or I don't like something, it dries for a long time. I would need to take another canvas. So I do the same as Jill. I just do a little sketches with colored pencils. And, and this is try to on teach the your side. students, though, when, when they come yes. to class, your workshops, you're both doing work, workshops. Yes. Well, now, this is, I have to tell you all, this, they are talking about the workshops that are going to be um, this uh, year. And this is 2009, it's in the fall. So you can use this information for any time any of you want to look for a teacher to help you uh, uncover your playfulness in your artwork. But, um, so they're specifically talking about something that's going to happen locally really soon. So this might be a rerun, it could be whenever. But anyway, but your students, whenever you teach, you're going to teach them how to be playful? How to be brave, how to, how be, to be playful, brave. and not to worry about how good it is and if it, if it looks like the place that you want it to 
B, you just have to just go for this. Mm -hmm. Play and encourage yourself to just use your imagination, take the strong color, and you don't have to worry. It's not college. We can just It's not play. college. It's one thing, too. Yeah. yeah it's not I mean, the word student is kind of hard sometimes because you might have a... Uh, you know, and an 80-year-old man come in to, to your class, That'll and you're calling him a student. So, so um, I actually need to move on a little bit about specifically. Now, Jill, yes. Maya, <laughs> you are going to tell us what you want your students to learn, not just what you're going to teach them and what you want to bestow on. You want them to have something ready for the, in the first, your first lecture, your first workshop day. What do you want them to bring, and what do you want them to start with? So, Maya, please tell us. Basically, uh, you've got a bunch of stuff here. Yes. What do you got? What do you got? Definitely a big brush like this one. Let me see this. Yes. Wow, this is a darn big brush. Let's yes. Take a look at this. It's very helpful. Start yes. with this one. So start with the whole, uh, for example, background, and then details in the end. First, you need to set the composition, and if the composition looks good, you can add more layers. So at the beginning, using more transparent paints, and once when you're ready. You can just keep working. Now, transparent paints. Finish. So these different paints that you have here, so some of them are transparent, and they tell you if they're transparent, right? Because you can tell here. Yes. Well, they all have different. You can ask the people at the art stores, but this one here has a. Um, you can see the black lines underneath the paint, and that right. tells you that it's transparent. Right. Right. And you want transparent. Well, anyway, this is getting too detailed. I don't want to do that. What do you want your students to know when you are? Let's just say it's your first day. And uh, <laughs> somebody's talking to me over. I'm not sure what you're saying to me, but but let's say it's your first day. What do you want your students to? In, in like in a minute, what would you say to them in their first minute? Of, you say, "Hello, class. Today, I hope you have your." We're going to paint landscape. Whether this is from the postcard. So you want your postcards. We want to bring the inspiration, something that inspired us and we remembered. For example, That's, you and subject. I are very similar exactly. in that way, in that. The, the forms and colors, the figures that I use aren't anatomical. Right. They're, they're from here. They're from memory. And so I, I would ask students to bring in even old photographs exactly. that, that have a really strong memory. And that will drive you into a stronger here's, here's another one. You can just uh, see the Ooh. colors, that the colors <laughs> can inspire you, or the composition, or the subject. And wherever you find the subject, even on the t-shirt, whatever works for you, as long as it looks good uh, on the canvas later and you're happy about it, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have to be real. There isn't actually, in fact, any place like this. Everything was from imagination. Uh -huh. You just catch the essence of what you like, whether it's the contrast between uh, purple and blue, or it's the reflection in the water, or just the tree, or the sky. Anything that inspires you, just you can use the inspiration on the canvas and don't worry about the reality. Well, what's the, what's the inspiration here? You've got a t-shirt here you also brought. You said you could even use a t-shirt as inspiration for a painting. And, and it's just really where you put your lines for the horizon line. And exactly. Any other, what do you got in here? You've got so this is the landscape with the like, really dark sky. And you have to look closer to see that there are some buildings over there. But it really doesn't matter. I really like the contrast of the like, heavy purple, which kind of pulls down. But um, that works for me. I like that. You know what's so fun interesting is that people think often that um, that they uh, artists are people that can draw from memory. They just have everything memorized and they just they just paint without reference. We need reference material, whether it's going to be something you've collaged together. Those are our notes, our cheat sheets. Yeah, yeah. they're notes. Nobody does this kind of thing, right? Nobody nobody uh, writes a book or or paints a painting right. straight out of their head unless it's pure fabrication, but usually when people that fabricate, they have to do research. So um, so what do we have here on time there, Patty? You're good. Okay, well, I don't know what time it is. Our, my, you know, the, the studio clock is gone. Where are we? We're at 18 and a half minutes in. in. Okay. You know, it's backwards, everybody. We go backwards. We start at 28, 30, and we're going to 18. So, okay. So uh, I just want to make sure, because sometimes we get, we get so carried away with our discussions. I, do you ever lose track of time when you're in a we, discussion we you actually love? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Can I talk about uh, the things that I would have my students bring in? I would or, love Or anybody who's, who's wanting to make art. And some of the things I work with, you've seen these um, Let's have some collage. More. I would just buy and frame this one. <laughs> <laughs> some beautiful some sketches, sketches. You know, that's better actually than the true. Painting, you right? don't you're right. yeah. need to have big finished painting necessarily sometimes yeah. this small this is already art right piece becomes something that i wasn't expecting exactly and 
having the working with collage to me is like working with large areas of paint. And if I want to later, I can, I can paint. But the collage is also like a kind of paint where I'm putting it together. So you bring in pieces of paper. You could bring in fabric, photographs. Um, water media to me is, is better for a workshop because it dries faster, easier cleanup. Um, mm -hmm. Glue sticks, that sort of thing. I use ordinary Elmer's glue sticks and scissors sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's all you need. And that's What's this one here? What do you got here? This one shows um, a process. Um, there was an, I had an inspiration of a friend who had this beautiful sarong. And <laughs> she came to my house and she was picking something up. And I love the shape of this sarong. And this was the first study that I did. And I thought it was a little complicated. Oh. And I simplified it. Oh, I like I this one you know, And I love this painting. Yes, I did. I ended up doing a larger painting because this had the feeling. I'm going to put these side by it. side. Take a look at this. So maybe one is more realistic. You know, you, you can see the figure. This one is much more stylized. But by working small, I was able to quickly see that I wasn't satisfied with the way that that felt. And then I did this one. And I'll, I'll often keep these around for a while. And I'll keep going back to, like, you know what, that one... I can really keep working on that and make it larger and make it bigger. And you did. Yes. It's a fantastic painting. And I'll tell you, I've seen other artists be inspired by this. I was at uh, Michael Rosen Rosenthal's gallery last year, and I saw a painting very similar to this in his gallery. And it was a very successful painting. It was a different, different palette, yes. but same design. Yes. Yeah, the same study. So you have succeeded to the point of inspiring other artists. And what yeah. else do you have here? And this is a, a large, I would call it a painting sketch. And so I would usually work smaller on paper, and then I'm starting to work out color palette here. And the reason that I do that is to go larger. I need to have enough paint mix since I work in acrylic. I need to know that I've got enough of this red and enough of that purple. Otherwise, what, what I find is I, I run out of that color, and then I mix something else, and it's not quite right, or I work with too small of a brush. Hmm. Ah. So I'm ready to go big after I've done a study like this, and I get the big brushes and, and look larger. Wow. And this is the big brush you use? This looks like an Asian brush from um, India? No, I believe this is actually for stenciling. Oh, um, uh -huh, okay. But I often I use house paint brushes as Me well. Too. Oh, I, you know, I was yes. looking at this thinking, thinking it's perfect. you can get this as a house paint brush, too, because uh, you know uh, sometimes art brushes are a lot more costly then yeah, I use the cheap brushes like this just for the background. And yeah, you just do this fast. Except that you don't want to have hair fall out of your brush and get stuck on the that's canvas. True. So you right. pick that's up. getting more detailed. We don't want to do that. We're talking about beginning a class and students what they want to, what you want to give them, and what they need to know the first day. What they they need to come with supplies, and so they need to have different size brushes. So everything from from large, large brushes to, uh, to smaller brushes. And usually a, a workshop is not detailed, so you don't want to have tiny, teeny brushes where you're getting detailed, like the size you know, of, of like a single eyelash. You, know, you want to have things that are pretty, pretty big and broad uh, for a workshop. The classes that go on week after week, you end up getting smaller brushes towards the end of the project because that's when you're going more detail. But mm, workshops are often really big, broad um, paintings that would be something like these two here. So that's what we're talking about, workshops. And um, Jill is doing abstracted figures. Ta-da! And, 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 and uh, Maya is in, in acrylic, and Maya is, uh, is going to have oil-painted uh, landscapes based on, um, on photographs or postcards. And um, they're going to be on canvas also. And, and for figures, I would uh, sometimes even just a bare silhouette of a figure, like, like the trees on here, right. is all it takes. And so you can have reference material for that. And especially if you have something that's very small and simplified. And I'll bring digital camera and computer. And we'll enlarge it so you can get this nice big chunky shape of a figure. But you don't have to get in and do all the details. No, no, I don't see your, your painting. Now, let's we look at this painting over here. Can, I don't know, if, can anybody get over to this painting uh, of Jill's? She, uh, we've talked a bit about Maya's over here. Well, let's talk about Jill's a little bit. You don't have small brush strokes. What you might have, if you see any small uh, 
elements in this painting, it's because they're left behind because mm -hmm. so, something you painted first and then you painted on top of it and you left a streak of something behind, not a because you used behind. a teeny brush. Yes. You just left a sliver behind from an underpainting. Right. You'll see a lot of blue marks around the edges of the figure, and I didn't paint any of those with a little brush. That is, I primed the canvas blue so that that would show through, and I intended to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's part of unblanking the canvas as so well. So when you have your class, are mm -hmm. you going to teach people? So but this, I'm going to bring this one up again. Um, you, can, so you did the same thing here. You, it's blue underneath, and then you painted light blue in the dark, and you've left that sliver of blue left. Yes. So would that be something that you would show them, that that's an interesting element to your painting? It's, it's, a, it's a way of making sure that your painting works as a whole, so that there aren't these little sort of leftover areas. There actually are leftover areas here, but it looks very intentional because I've, I've selected a color for them to be by painting the canvas prior to starting. Do you think that you can actually teach somebody how to design a canvas? I think so. I think... Um, we're going to use, like I said, digital camera. So ah. we can take a photograph and we can enlarge and reduce and we can crop. And also I wanted to work a bit on something called value. That's the lights and darks mm -hmm. in your painting. And mm -hmm. that's something that, that's hard to, to think about. But we'll use some tools so that people can see what their sketches look like. If they're high contrast, low contrast, you know. Well, you know, there's color. A, the, uh, sorry for interrupting your end of that comment, but I also wanted to talk about Will Maller, who's mm -hmm. not here today. He was going to join us today, but he is in a class himself in San Francisco. So he's teaching plein air painting, and I know both of you have experience with plein air painting, and he did come here, and he dropped off his plein air um, uh, easel, which is very different from what we do in the studio. And I'm going to disassemble it, because people need to be able to take an easel into the field with their paints. And it's very different than us having all our stuff in our field, all, uh, in our uh, studio all the time. So I'm going to walk over to, oops, I'm going to walk over to the, uh, to the uh, easel that Will gave us, and I'm going to deconstruct it. So you'll see how easy it is to do. And this is a painting that he, this is literally a pa this is the size of canvas that people use when they go out field painting because uh, you don't want to take a giant canvas like, like what they were showing us over here because it's too hard to carry. So you take this home and then you use it as reference material much like these clip pieces that they were showing us, uh, what Maya and Jill were showing us. Now this is how the, the canvas, I'm sorry, this is the easel that you would use. You can move this up and down, uh, but again it's usually really small uh, canvases that are on here. and, uh, and this is going to turn into something smaller than a briefcase, maybe the size of a briefcase. And I'm going to start by, by uh, first collapsing the top here. I'm turned around. You just unscrew things, and uh, and this goes down. And this is the tray where you have your paints, right? So you collapse this down, and then there are. If I can collapse it down properly, there we go. Oops. Did I not unscrew this properly? So I practiced this several times before, but before all of you came. But let's just pretend this claps, both of them clasp here on top. And it's not collapsing. So of course, when I'm doing this on tape and in front of the studio audience, it's not working properly. But normally this would collapse. <laughs> and this was collapsed. I, I, I think like we a, can imagine. It's like a briefcase. Clap, this is a clasp here. Overall size. And there that. it is. Now this is a 30-year-old, this is a 30-year-old um, easel. And Will has used this from here in Minnesota. The next thing you do is you actually have to get down on your knees, believe it or not, because you've got paint in here. Remember, you've got paint in here. So you get down on one knee, and you turn it sideways. And then you collapse your leg, first leg, and then you uh, shorten this one here. Oops, sorry. You have to screw this in this way. There you go. Well, and, and that is a 30-year-old easel, so this there are certainly ones easel. that are yes. go up and down aluminum legs, and they're much faster. Right. Yeah. So, Jill, why don't you talk about how you actually did plein air painting I in did. France? Yes. Um, in France. Yes, in France, in, in Aix-en-Provence. And I was with a group that um, was taught by um, students of Leo Marchutz, who was mm -hmm. a student of Cezanne. Wow. So we would go paint the mountain and paint in Aix-en-Provence painted oil paint, um, 
one of the things that I learned is we would gesso cardboard. And gesso, of course, sucks up oil really quickly. And so you could end up with a dry painting mm -hmm. or a sketch, a dry sketch, um, pretty quickly. And I, I use water media now. And so I haven't had a chance to do any outdoor painting. But now there are uh, acrylics that have a longer working time. And I've been using Golden Open in my studio. And, and I'm ready to take it out in the field, too. Now, you grew up in Poland. Is yes, that the paint would be freezing. So you don't <laughs> really want to do the outside and outdoor. But uh, I still did it. It was yeah. probably more in high school. And yes, we did uh, oils. So yeah. it was pretty messy. And you have to carry this. But basically, your time is short because it gets dark, it gets cold. So you have to work pretty fast. Now it's convenient with acrylics or like the way I paint right now. It's not anymore outdoor. It's just uh, from my memory. And I do sketches outside, mm -hmm. sitting on the beach, for example. And then I paint indoor. It's probably not as much fun. But uh, in California here, it's perfect. You can go anywhere. The weather is always nice. In fact, there's a big resurgence of plein air painting. And Will yes. is one of the people that is uh, moving it forward. Exactly. He's got lots of... Uh, lots of uh, awards and prizes from states and uh, other states as well. So uh, so this is, by the way, here it is. Here is your briefcase size easel after, you know, and you can turn it into a standard size easel. And you never want to turn it upside down because you have paints inside. You wouldn't want them to splat around. Um, so now I know that I'm going to, did you have anything else to say about plein air painting? We just talk about a little bit difference in weather. In weather. France and Poland, quite a difference. Then California. Yes, and California would be more like it? France. Yes, so yeah. the I paints don't freeze anymore. You can just go and paint. So. <laughs> yeah, we don't have paints, paints no. freezing here. One, one of the, the benefits of, of that type of painting, though, especially if you get a chance to travel a bit, is by being outside and observing the landscape. You see how the light is really different in California, in That's Poland, true. in even northern versus southern California. It's a It's a different color palette completely. Right. And it's difficult, I think, for most of us to see that because we see snapshots right. and they tend to even everything out. And if you spend you know, hours observing, you really get a sense of where you are. And you're also out um, in Provence. It was a scent of lavender and rosemary. Mm, and it's a very sensual nice. experience as well. Right. I also like the fact that when you are outdoor, you pretty much have to work faster, yes. right? So it's more sketchy whether when you work in the studio uh, you can come back and you can work right. more. So you're kind of losing that sketchy, like mm -hmm. fresh painting. In the classroom, when you work too much, it comes out a little bit overdone. Sometimes. So that's the big difference. It's really, those are two different things. Speaking of classrooms, yeah. the two of you and Will and many, many other artists from this area that are, I've researched and found some very, very accomplished other artists uh, besides the three of you who are extremely willing and happy to teach as well. So in the spring and early win or late winter, we're going to be teaching classes that are once a week for 11 weeks, so almost on a quarterly basis. There'll be a couple weeks as a break in between, but it'll be uh, different. So you're going to have a different sort of, of um, approach to teaching. So like I was talking earlier, they're not going to be doing something quick and fast with big brushes. You might even use smaller brushes, even smaller than this, or maybe the edges so you can um, you can get in a little more detail. Yeah. So I think you're going to, or maybe you'll do some other things. Maybe you're going to use more collage and just mm -hmm. go from collage. I know that you have this, there's a new thing that's been going out there as well, the ripping paper and turning it into using it's paper as your media. Or or maybe there'll be some, um, some wax um, uh, paintings as well. There's a lot of new things coming up. Now, now um, I know that, Maya, your artwork is very, you, you do portraits. You do these right. fresh portraits. They're almost yes. flat. And it's very popular and very difficult because people learn to do portraits and they want to get more and more phot photographic -like. Right. And then you'd have to go beyond that and go back to almost how you were as a child, except yes. that you know how faces work. Yes. Well, with portrait, it's a little bit like uh, painting outdoor. You have to work fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's very different experience because you're with a person. So at the beginning, you talk. And after a while, people might fall asleep because they're getting relaxed. And uh, The person you're painting? Yes, yes. So it happened a few times. But uh, <laughs> it's very interesting because actually here, you, you have personality besides the look. Uh, once when you talk, you really learn about the person, unless you already know that person. So that personality 
uh, it really comes out in the end, and it's kind of subconscious. You just you're just painting the face, you're painting the look, but then in the end, uh, somehow you can see who this person is, which is mm -hmm. probably very interesting. Are you conscious them. of the the colors that you choose for each portrait, or is that just as it happens? There are certain people that are red. Usually, or the blue. person inspires me. Yeah. So sometimes it's uh, earrings, or sometimes it's the shirt. Or sometimes it's just the color of the hair or the eyes, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't plan Good. really. So it, you have to just work your fast. Intuitive, you have to, your yes, you have to do this fast. That's, that's the thing about art is you know you, everyone. Most people have heard of the book drawing in the right side of your brain, and there's the left is analytical, and that's where the words are, and the right is about feelings and emotions. And so when you're painting somebody, you want to be able to. Um, feel who they are so you can inject mm -hmm. that into your paintings. Yes, definitely. I, 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 you know this. In fact, both of you know Matthew Holloway. He was okay. an artist in the gallery that all of us were mm -hmm. shared at one point. And he painted pears. But he painted them in such a oh. way he, put, he injected a lot of emotion into it. And he actually brought one person to tears. She walked in the building. She saw this giant pear painting. And she started weeping. I didn't even know what the title meant. The title was Riverside. Turned out he painted it when his father had a heart attack mm -hmm. at the hospital of Riverside. Mm -hmm. And this woman just got it. Hmm. Of course, she bought it, too. Yeah. But I, and that's yes. part of what you're talking about, is that you get the emotion of the person, and you can choose the color. Right. Exactly. Sometimes I change the background color only in the end if I see oh. that uh, I want to show more, I don't know, the eye color mm -hmm. or the hair, I would change the background. But pretty much you get inspired right away. I think, I think the inspiration is something that I didn't learn in college. I have a lot of technical background right. that we, we never got, got to hear, and probably because I was only like 21 at the time. And, and we're pretty anxious about the kind of yeah. we Actually, we have to wrap up here yeah. in a moment. And I want to thank you both for coming very, very much. And I know that, that the uh, you know, learning and teaching are two different aspects of the same person, and one is after you've learned to integrate your emotions with mm -hmm. your intellect. And now you hopefully get the people that are intellectually coming in to learn to teach them how to open up their emotions, I think is what we're talking about. So thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Maya and Jill, thank you very much. And how do you say it in Poland? Uh, Nastrovia. 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 <laughs> Nastrovia. Thank you very much for coming tonight. And uh, we'll see you around the studio.